You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So on June the 3rd, we're back in Holland Park in West London with our third, frankly, triumphant word in your park. Isn't that right, Mark? We can, we can call it that, can't we? It's absolutely guaranteed to be sun-kissed. It's a, I like to feel the weather this weekend has just been a rehearsal for how wonderful the weather is going to be on June the 3rd in Holland Park. But it doesn't actually have to be all that beautiful, does it? Because we have the benefit of a covered amphitheatre, auditorium. What are we calling it? Auditorium. Auditorium. Yes, we use the um, the accommodation of Opera Horn Park, which is very, very commodious, very comfortable. Um, and on that day, we've got uh, three guests announced so far. We've got Bob Stanley is going to be talking about his upcoming book about the Bee Gees, which comes out that week. Uh, we've got Leslie Ann Jones talking about 60 years of the Rolling Stones, because it will be 60 years, pretty much to the day, uh, on June the 3rd, since the Rolling Stones' first single, first single came out. So she's going to be talking about that. And also, we've got John Higgs, who's going to be talking about uh, James Bond, The Beatles, and the British Psyche, uh, a wonderful book he wrote called uh, Love and Let Die. Because uh, the wonderful coincidence there is the first Beatles record, Love Me Do, came out on the same day as the first proper James Bond film, Doctor No. And so he's, he's used that as a jumping off point for the book to explore these two most enduring icons of... Uh, well, more than British entertainment, I suppose. Uh, he makes the point that they're both utterly unique. Um, and uh, interestingly, he says that while the Beatles were all about life, what is James Bond all about, Mark? What yeah, is it all? It's true. It's all about death. It's all about <laughs> copping a bullet, isn't it? Yeah. It's all about licenses to kill. Licenses to kill and avoiding die, death. And, and you only live twice and yeah, all, yeah. That, all, all that kind of thing. So it's not just a story about entertainment, it's a story about uh, about culture and the British psyche, but it's absolutely fascinating in all kinds of ways. The way, tiny little thing, which I never realised until this, is that Richard Vernon, you know Richard Vernon, who appears as the city gent in, in the opening of Hard Day's Night yeah. on, the, on, the railway, on the railway train, usually city gent with wearing a bungalow hat, he's also in Doctor No!, He's a kind of perfect senior senior figure. Uh, this was meant to be. It was absolutely meant to be. It's an absolutely fantastic book. And so anyway, those three people and more will all be there on the day. Yes, uh, Leslie Ann Jones the on the Stones and Bob Stanley on the Bee Gees. And yeah, it's all in, a, in a, as we said, in a gorgeous open sided tent in the auditorium of Opera Holland Park. And birds may sing and flowers may bloom, chill drinks may be taken. It'll be really good, won't it? It'll be really good. And if you haven't already got your tickets, make sure you do that uh, as soon as possible. And uh, a link to how you can buy tickets and be with us on that day uh, below this uh, below this podcast. So talking of the Beatles, Mark, something, something fresh sprung from the Beatles in yes. the last week, didn't it? It's absolutely extraordinary. It is it's absolutely gone. amazing. No, the, the story was that... As was uh, was brilliantly um, covered on a, an episode of Radio 4's Front Row by Samira Ahmed. Uh, on the, uh, this is on the 60th anniversary that this happened, on April the 4th, was that the Beatles, of course, had played Stowe School. And the, the, the centre of this, this piece that they did was the fact that the guy who booked them, who was 15 years old at the time, a schoolboy at, at Stowe called John Bloomfield, had recorded on a, on a reel-to-reel tape, had recorded the show, but had somehow never got around to either playing it to anyone or, or, or even telling people it existed. So that is a major revelation. And he has the, the entire show, I think, bar two numbers recorded. I mean, not obviously it's not very good quality, but you can hear the onstage banter and you can hear the entire set. And I thought the whole story was really interesting because I can, I've always thought the Beatles didn't want to do that date. You know, they were booked by a few months beforehand, or in fact, it turned out to be in February, wasn't it? 
um, by by Brian Epstein. I thought they they'd become quite successful and they'd, they'd had a number one record. They didn't want to, do it. but no, they did want to do it, and they were really enthusiastic and incredibly curious about seeing what Stowe School was like. There's a lovely bit at the end where they're taking a little tour of the school, and uh, John Lennon declares it to be a dump. The living accommodations are absolutely appalling. But the show is absolutely extraordinary. You know, they they played 22 songs in one hour. Good grief. That's what you want, isn't it? <laughs> 22 songs, which I'm working out is about two minutes a song plus absolutely. the kind of the, the in-between banter. There's a lovely bit in it where John Bloomfield talks about, uh, you know, how he, he, he when they came on and played the opening to I saw her standing there. She was just 17, if you know what I mean. He said, from that very instant, I went from boy to man. It's a complete kind of revelation to see a group like that and a world like that when you're at a, a kind of, you know, button-down public school like yeah, you. Yeah. And and it's the last chance, you know, after this, they they just tended to play their, their hits, as it were. And this was still the old Hamburg set. This is still them playing too much monkey business in Memphis, Tennessee and stuff. But it's amazing. And you wonder if that tape will be, I don't know, tarted up. It could do. Modern technology could improve that no end and it might well be released at some stage. You might also wonder what it's worth. It's astonishing. It's a great story. So if you happen to have an unplayed tape of the Beatles from 1963 or 64, you know, you never got out of your attic. Now's the time to do it and do get in touch. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. I've got a stack Woody game, Mark, sent in uh, from Australia, actually. Oh, right, good. Uh, by Peter Dassent. I think I've got that right, Peter. Uh, thanks very much for this. Uh, as I say, Peter's in Australia, but this is, this is New Zealand pop groups of the 1960s. Oh, right. um, and uh, actually, I wish I'd had this at hand because yesterday we spoke to spoke to Tim Finn, didn't we? <laughs> about we his, did uh, about his, his record that he's made with Andy White, and, and we could have I could have run this list in front of him. I'm sure he would have been familiar with them. But it appears from Peter's list that no country in the world produced groups with stranger names. The New Zealand did in the 1960s. Oh, this is good. Excellent. And, and so you have to tell me which of these is actually made up and which of them were real. Okay. All right. And, and uh, I'm how, gonna, many, how many ringers have we got in there? Just one? I've got, I, there's going to be, no, there's, there's one ringer and, and the, rest, the rest are real. The rest are real. And, uh, and so I'm going to have to go through the spellings because the spellings are just bizarre. So the first one is the chapter, spelled C-H-A-P-T-A, the chapter. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. The Down Under Sect. The Down That's Under good. Sect. You can imagine that. Now we get into the really weird things here. The High Revving Tongues, spelt H I dash R E double V I N G Tongues. How weird is that, Mark? The High Revving Tongues. Wow. We're about to get weirder. The calculated risk, spelt K A L dash Q dash L A T E D risk. The calculated risk. No. The lardy das. <laughs> That's brilliant. The lardy das. Uh, uh, all right. So there, there's your five. You got to pick which of those five. The chapter, the down under sex. The high revving tongues, two more from them later. The calculated risk and the lardy does. That Which is one of those? Fantastic. Isn't that bizarre? They're really, really good, I think. <laughs> well, I'm going to say, tell me at the end, I'm going to say the high revving tongues is real because it's just so It's too bizarre. weird. You couldn't it's possibly. Absolutely could not make it up. I think I would say the same for the calculated risk because it's just an exercise. Obviously, obviously, those kind of weird spellings were a thing out there at the time. The Lardy Dars, I'm also saying, is real because there was an obsession, certainly in America, with kind of um, with kind of British aristocracy, actually, and uh, you know the idea that you 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 somehow kind of uh, borrowed a little bit of our, uh, our the, the, the poshness of UK culture. In your name, so I think that's probably real. The chapter I think is probably real because I think there would have been a, 
I could probably come some kind of mod group. So I'm saying, although it's just absolutely brilliant, that the based obviously on the downliner sect, the down under sect, I think is the one that's made up. Which, but I think that's just so brilliant. I'm rather hoping it wasn't made up, and I'd love it to be real. Now, once again, you've illustrated the difficulty of this game is making up one <laughs> that sounds plausible. Uh, you're absolutely right. The down under sect was the invention of Peter Dasson. Uh, the rest, the chapter, the high revving tongues, the calculated risk, the lardy dars, and I haven't. He's even supplied some further ones actually. The Quincy conserve wow. and the simple image. Those were all real, real That's New fantastic. Zealand pop groups in the 1960s. And I got this. He sent this to me, and I thought. I can't just run this without checking it. So I, I went and looked, and sure enough, it's absolutely right. All those groups existed. All those groups have pages on Wikipedia somewhere Fantastic. where you can read about them. It's absolutely That's really good. Yeah, yeah. What so a all rich that, team. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, Peter. So if anybody else has got a, a suggestion for a stat what he came, please get in touch via the usual address. So none of those groups... Uh, we're we're uh, kind of remembered much by posterity, apart from Peter, uh, to be contrasted with a group who we've both been watching a film about, uh, but rather belatedly in the last week, which is we've both been watching Todd Haynes' film about the Velvet Underground, which was uh, which is on what's it on? It's Apple, Apple, on Apple TV. Isn't on it? Apple TV, really good, really worth seeing. It it's came out, fr- I think came out at the end of last year, but we've only just got around to it, haven't we? Yeah, and it sort of doesn't matter, you know, because they only just got around to making a film about the Velvet Underground all those years. Yeah. All those years later. Which is kind of the fascinating thing, isn't it? Can you remember when the Velvet Underground first entered your consciousness? Um well, not till about I suppose maybe sixty eight, sixty nine, maybe sixty nine. Would it? Have yeah, been? I think it'd be the same with me. When, I, was, I, when did that first record come out? Well, they're sixty seven. The first one, isn't I it? I don't think it was still sixty nine because you just didn't know about it until somebody got hold of a copy of it and played it to you. you know? Well, I I remember seeing the the you know the banana cover and so forth. Yeah, um, but I knew nothing more than that. I suppose. You know, somebody like John Peel must have played it on Top Gear uh, yeah. back in, back in the day. I can't say I particularly remember, but yes, I I would have heard it later, sixty nine, sixty nine, seventy. So it's really interesting that they were a they were a kind of concept that people entirely came across in, it came across in retrospect. Absolutely, they? absolutely. <laughs> that's the that's the really curious thing about them that they kind of gone, you know, because the, the famous story of, of David Bowie in uh, in New York in 1971, where he found, he goes to New America for the first time, and he gets to see see the Velvet Underground, and he gets into the dressing dressing room, and he's infusing to Lou Reed about how exciting he finds, it, finds his songs. And it's only later he finds out he's not talking to Lou Reed, he's talking to Doug Yule. <laughs> That's right. Because Lou Reed has <laughs> left, left the group as a bad job. He's kind yeah. of walked away at that point. Yeah. He's gone back to his father's um, bookkeeping business in Long Island. Uh, so, so it was already all over by then, you know, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary idea, really. And uh, so there's the film being made all these years later. And the real witnesses are uh, John Cale, who's very good, isn't he, John Cale? John Cale's fantastic. And one of those and rare examples of people who just looks better and better. He always looked fabulous when he was young, but he looks even better now. Also, the older he gets, the more fantastic he looks. It also sounds fabulous. He's got a yeah, wonderful, wonderful speaking voice. Yeah, he's got that mixture of tiny ghosts of a Welsh accent. Oh, more, more than accent. a ghost, actually. I yeah. think it's still, you know, still identifiable. And then there's Mo Tucker, uh, you know, because they're the only two... Um, Living members of the of the kind of the original group, and they're both they're both very good talking about it. But I mean, so many of the other people, Andy Warhol and all those people, are no longer no longer with us. And um, I tell you, what struck me is just extraordinary is that um, they were genuinely alternative 
at the time. You know? Really alternative. In the sense that there was nobody. No, they couldn't stand alongside anybody, could they? I mean, that was kind of their drawback. You know that they were not part of a scene, were they? You know, absolutely no. I was. I felt the same because they're they're so kind of on brand. On the most basic level, they wear black, don't they? Yeah, they wear black. When they first go to Los Angeles to play, well, they go down pretty badly actually. Everyone else is wearing kind of psychedelic clothes, and yeah. they're still dressed in black. They don't sort of belong in daylight, actually. They're no, absolutely. That's a very good them. point. <laughs> and they they also hate so much about the outside world. They hate hippies. They hate they hate Frank Zappa, don't they? Yeah. They, they loathe and detest loads of things that are very very popular in, in in culture at the time, and so that makes them incredibly independent. There's nobody like them, and uh, I, I thought I thought they they're, they're they're quite hard to warm to. Oh yeah. It made me feel it was quite a joyless world. Somebody talks about um, the the factory where a lot of this all takes place. Obviously Warhol's intervention and uh, making the films that were projected onto them you know and this is the people came to the factory they came because the cameras were running and they thought they could be stars and so you're in this very very anxious self-conscious atmosphere the entire time where everyone's trying to kind of make themselves legendary and there's very little humor is that everyone's trying very hard to be uh, to be kind of uh, no you know, nobody i don't i think i'm right in saying nowhere in the film uh, it's a little bit like reading patty smith's autobiography at no stage does anybody ever say do you know a funny thing happened <laughs> no, no, not once not once not once does anybody say ah oh, this was a bit amusing this went a bit too far or, yeah i was Someone's talking about lou reed at one point and says that lou reed is going around telling people i'm going to be rich and i'm going to be a rock star and they said he liked making people uncomfortable that was his comfort he yes. said what a difficult guy i think both of us actually have interviewed him how true that was yeah, it always made you feel really agonised, you know. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but they they were thoroughly alternative, and and I couldn't help thinking of the the great irony when you watch the film, and it's very it's very good film, is that this group, who used to be completely unique, <laughs> spawned the greatest look alike and sound alike movement in popular music yeah there are more groups there have been ever since more groups who would like to be counted as being the kind of uh, the, the aesthetic you know um brothers and sisters of the velvet underground than there are of any other group Absolutely. <laughs> you could do whole festivals. You know, the enemy for years just used to feature groups who wish they were the Velvet Look, Underground. It sounded like, you know, the, you know Jesus and Mary Chain yeah, or whatever. Absolutely. Exactly that was there. Millions of them. Whole screaming. radio stations devoted to yeah, things yeah. that sounded, sounded a bit like the Velvet Underground. You know, that, that the, the kind of... We're a bit weird. We're a bit out there. We're yeah, a yeah. bit edgy. You know, that's uh, that became. It's the most classic example of. We keep qu quoting the George Melly thing: revolt into style. Yeah, it's it's the most classic example of uh, of uh, revolt into style you can possibly imagine. You know, it started as absolute outsiders, and then became the herd. Years later, years later, long after they'd gone. It's just absolutely extraordinary, you know, because yeah. Jonathan Richmond turns up in the film. He's very good. He's fantastic yeah. because he's he talks really about, he explains their sound and what, yeah. they, what they wrote about. And he said, my feeling when I saw them was that these people would understand me. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, so he, he was a teenager. He was a teenager, you know, at the yeah. time. And, um, and so he's absolutely besotted with them. And then they stop. And... And then, about two years later, he makes those records with the Modern Lovers, which are very directly influenced by the Velvet Underground, they are. Like Sister Ray and those, yeah, those kind of things. Very simple chord sequences. Yeah, there's very blocks yeah. of sound, you know, a kind of very blank vocal. And then nothing happens again yeah. for a few years, you know. And it sort of happens you're in punk, but it kind of happens after punk, doesn't it, really? Yes. It's like you say, it's the Jesus and Mary chain and, and people like that. 
uh, that that take up that that kind of sound. Uh, it's an extraordinary tale. It, it's very definitely, very definitely it worth is, seeing. Uh, You've probably seen it already. You're probably quicker than that, me. <laughs> it's probably that, as with so many, with so many bands, you know, that the, there are certain absolutely integral pieces of the jigsaw that had they not been there, it wouldn't have worked. And I felt with John Cale that he wouldn't, he just simply wouldn't have made it without the intervention of three people. One is, is with uh, Lou Reed, rather. One is, is, is John Cale, because Lou Reed's actually relatively um, orthodox in some ways. You know, he grew up with with, with uh, doo-wop. Yeah, yeah. He's in a group uh, playing R&B covers. Um, and then, but John Cale is really, really avant-garde. The film opens with him on a television show, doesn't it, yeah. in America, talking about um, uh, an 11-hour orchestral piece uh, and illustrating uh, bits of it on the piano. So he's really, really avant-garde. He's the one interested in drones and into classical yeah. music and jazz and stuff. He's the one who has the idea that the, the Velvet Underground should be combining, you know, R&B and Wagner. So without him, Lou Reed wouldn't have made it. Without Andy Warhol, I mean, Andy Warhol got them the deal, partly he was. because Andy Warhol offered to do the cover of the album. Yep. And then Andy Warhol came to all the recordings. Although he didn't do anything, the fact that he was in the room meant that they could record anything they wanted because no producer was going to turn around and say, you can't do that, if Andy Warhol was there, which I thought was really interesting. And the other person, I think, without whom, was Nico. You know, that Warhol yes. has this brilliant idea that or even Definitely. although he's in love with Lou Reed, apparently, he thinks that Lou Reed isn't a very strong singer and he also isn't good-looking enough. So he says, right... Jared Mal Malanga comes back with this record from Europe with Nico on it, and he hears this girl singing genuinely quite out of tune, quite out of pitch, isn't it? Yeah. But she looks fantastic. And he just looks thinks, fantastic. that's the girl. Let's get her in the group. I mean, that's brilliant. It is. Absolutely And without right. her being in that group, it's quite possible that mo no one would have taken any notes. You can't tell. But, uh, but the, the Warhol thing is key because I can remember that, you know, when I first saw the album cover, as I say, 1967, something like that. Yeah. It, it announced itself as Andy Warhol presents the Velvet Underground, didn't it? Yeah. And Nico. He, and he, Nico. Was, he was the top line, really, yeah. in the thing. He was the sell, you know. He was. Um, because he was, just, he was just a kind of hip name. And nobody really knew why he was a hip name. But he apparently was a hip name. Yes, absolutely. And uh, and so that really matters them. The rivalry with the Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention is particularly interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. they were signed to the same label, weren't they? The yeah. Verve label. Very but unlikely. Verve decided that Zappa was the big commercial story and then therefore lost all interest in the Velvet Underground. Well, you, it's kind of the way record companies are. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, let's find two weird groups and then we'll, we'll back one. We'll back yeah. the one who appear to be most energetic. <laughs> and so and so the month of the invention were, were certainly it. And so the um, Mo Tucker particularly talks about how she hated the month of invention and all that peace and love. I thought, I don't remember much peace and love coming from the Mothers of invention, do you? No, at all. <laughs> I think her just the person, opposite. <laughs> absolutely, very definitely the opposite. But um, they the hated opposite. hippies too, actually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, who didn't? Yeah. <laughs> the word podcast. Clearly, there is no plan. In line with our policy of bringing you up to the minute news <laughs> on what's happening in the world of rock and pop. Yes, we've just done the Velvet Underground and the Beatles, so. <laughs> So I thought it only natural that we should bring it right up to date by looking at the singles chart from 40 years ago this week, Mark. Which is fantastic. It's fantastic, isn't it? And uh, oh, what, virtually every, I think I'd remembered virtually every one <laughs> of the hundred records listed in it. And everyone's, and it made you think what an absolutely amazing time it was in terms of the variety of stuff that could happily coexist. Wasn't it wonderful? So, so number one. <laughs> Was David Bowie's Let's Dance, which was, I think, his, his last number one. His last number one, I think. Um, With that amazing video shot in Australia. Yes. Yeah, because he's two, you know, two videos around about the time, because this was about the time of China Girl, wasn't it? China yeah. Girl also also came off, that, um, came off that album. Do you remember that, where he was... I think we have to say frolicking in the surf, he wasn't was. he? With a with with a naked 
a kind of from from here to eternity moment. Wasn't it? That's <laughs> yes, right. absolutely. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course that was uh, it was uh, Nile Rodgers, wasn't it, that produced that record? It was Nile Rodgers who made the the key decision, which was start with the chorus. You know, yeah. Rogers, whose whose motto is always "Don't bore us, get to the chorus." Get to the chorus, and uh, and let's dance. He was the person who would listen to it, saying, "Start with the chorus." That's a very a very wise decision that that proved to be. But you say, I mean, you can remember number two in that chart, "Church of the Poison Mind" by Culture Club. Number three, three is there something I should know by Duran Duran? Break away, Tracy Ullman. Beat it, Michael Trace Jackson. Away, to do break away with Tracy Ullman singing into a hairbrush, wasn't it? Was it the one where she got Neil oh. Kinnicon? Or was that another one? I can't remember. I might have Smash It's readers were very uh, dubious about Tracy Ullman. They kind of liked her, but they also thought she was too old. Oh. Because <laughs> she probably was about 28 or something. You know? yeah, she probably wouldn't be quite uh, that old. And yeah. then number five, you've got Beat It by Michael Jackson. Now, do you still remember number six, Boxer Beat by the Joe Boxer? Uh, well, I do, obviously, because I'm the person who put um, the Joe Boxers on the cover of Smash Hits, thinking that was going to be a hit. And you know what? I just checked that chart, Dave, and the highest chart position of Boxer Beat by the Joe Boxers was number three. So oh, I was you. right. I mean, yeah, they didn't exactly right. set, the, set the world on fire, did they? But they look great, the Joe Boxes. They're brilliant. And do you remember with affection Snot Rap by, by Kenny Everett? I do. Which is number nine that week. My I God. Do. Kenny Everett, you completely forget. Kenny Everett was a big deal, a really big deal. He had a, that sketch show, and he did a, a kind of a skit about Rod Stewart, a version of Do You Think I'm Sexy? Yeah. Do you remember that, where his trousers inflated to the point where they turned into balloons and he then floated up to the ceiling of the studio? And actually it did incredible damage to Rod Stewart's reputation. It probably did. A bit like Bo Selector versus Craig David. It really did him some harm and everyone used to go on about how ludicrous Rod Stewart was for years after that. I went to a recording of that, of uh, the Kenny Everett video show, probably oh, yeah. around about this time or slightly earlier. Uh, with the pretenders, well, and the pretenders were um, this must have been down at Shepherd. Oh God, what was he called? Uh, what Shepherdton or whatever? Yeah, and um, were they the musical uh, act then? Or? They were the musical act, yeah. dressed as punks. They were a kind of it was a kind of piss take a punk. They were all you know, kind of leather and safety. I pins remember and it. so forth, and. There was Kenny Everett, and there was Barry Cryer, who used to write it, and John Junkin, who also used to write it. John Junkin, who played the Beatles' second roadie in A Hard Day's Night, doesn't he? Yes. remember John Junkin, a tall, distinctive figure. And anyway, uh, James Honeyman Scott, out of the pretenders, decided that he was going to go for it by wearing leather trousers and no shirt. And so he appeared on the in the studio in leather trousers and no shirt with his guitar slung around his neck. And Barry Cryer, who was standing near I was standing near at the time, just kind of looked at him sidelong and then looked down and said, Oh, it reminds me, I must, must get some lard. <laughs> And brilliant, brilliant Barry Cryer. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> brilliant Barry Cryer. So yeah, they, 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 I, I said to you, there is there are always things in in an old chart that you remember, and then there are things that you think, is that real or was that just a dream I had? You know, was there? Is it could it really be the case that in the chart from forty years ago, you had Peter Tosh doing Johnny B. Good? I know. Absolutely. How did that happen? Absolutely bizarre. You had uh, you had U two two heart species one. You, you, you had Marion does... Wilson doing Crimea River. Yes, and I have to say, looking through that that uh, chart, Mary Wilson's still going. You know, which you cannot say of the vast majority of the people in that chart still there. Still, uh, Mary Ma- Ma- Wilson's still going, and Claire Grogan altered images still yeah. going, and who were in, who were in that chart, and also still going. I think, and I'm going to put it to you. Yeah, I've sent you this whole chart. What is the greatest record in that particular chart? Would you like to go first? Because I've got my chart. I think I know what your answer is going to be, and I thought. 
Well, I think um, Sweet Dreams is a good record. Eurythmics record is good. Um, now, I'm not talking about good. I'm talking about great. Is there a great record in Beat that Beat It chart? is great. Um, Beat It is pretty good. It is Blue okay. Monday. Blue Monday is a great record. That's in there. Blue, okay, I'll give you Blue Monday. Yeah, Blue Monday is yeah. It was a very different kind of record, wasn't it? Yeah. But I'm going to say that the greatest record on that chart from 40 years ago this week. And if you think you can do better, go and have a look at it. It's all there on the on the internet. My nomination for the greatest record in that entire chart, a chart that can you know, contains David Bowie's Let's Dance and. New Order's Blue Monday and, uh, and uh, you know, what do we call it? Snot. <laughs> Snot, Snot rap. rap. <laughs> By Kenny Celtic Abbott. Soul Brothers is in there, isn't it? Okay. But the it greatest... Of, not, don't stop. The greatest of all these is Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart. I'm sorry. It just is. I'm not saying it because I particularly like it, but if if you have... Any, if you have a, a, a place in your heart at all for any of the works of Jim Steinman, Meatloaf, Cher, whatever, the greatest of all these is Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse in the Heart because she's the best singer of all that lot and she absolutely commits to this mad, over-the-top concept uh, and does it brilliantly. And also, it's the most perfect Jim Steinman record because it's called Total Eclipse of the Heart. What an extraordinary idea. They must have just written that title down and thought, there has to be, there a, has song. To be a song in this. There has to be a song. There. I know. It's a great record. It's, it's fantastic. fantastic. I found record. the old copy of Smash Hits uh, that, that came out at the time, actually, which has Tracy on the cover. Do you remember oh, Tracy? God. Well, I do. I invented the house that, was it the house of Jack Bill? What was it called? The the record. Yeah, she had? house of Jack Bill. I house of Jack Bill, and and I, I, I just in it, I was flicking through it a minute ago, and uh, there's a piece about Bonnie Tyler, and there's uh, two pictures of her. Such a good headline. I'm thinking it was probably one of yours, and uh, there's a picture of her in about 1977 with her kind of uh, you know straight hair and kind of right. and, and then there's her the kind of. Uh, you know the kind of uh, the, you know, the pub head kind of uh, uh, pop vixen of 1983, and the headline is the two. It's the two Bonnies, which I thought was very good. Actually, oh, the two I, don't, I don't remember right. But that, Tracy, but. I remember that really well because Paul Weller didn't he come and see you? He and rang say, Can me you up. He yeah. rang me up, and now I, I, I've just got a dim memory because I'd obviously met him a few times. Yeah, and he rang me up. And this is the time when the, when the jam were a really, obviously, really big deal. Yeah. I just picked up the phone. Hello. He says, it's Paul from the jam. <laughs> it's not Paul Weller. It's Paul from the jam. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah. And uh, he said, I'm starting this label, and I want to um, find a, an untried young female singer. I think he must have said female. Yeah, he must have done. Uh, would you just run something and smash it? saying we're looking for somebody and good people send in tapes or whatever. It's kind of yeah. like Apple records, but, but you know, 15 years later or whatever. And I said, yeah, sure. And we just ran this thing in bits, I think. Yeah. Saying if you, if you think you've got any talent and, um, that's where Tracy came from. And, and she had two, they, they had two, they had that one, she had another one. She was on the cover about three or four months later. Again, with, the media is very divided about it because it was one of those weird things where if you were a kind of 15-year-old girl, Tracy was only about 17 or 18, you know. Yeah, you looked yeah. at that and part of you thought, fantastic. You know, a girl like me has, you know, had a hit and that's wonderful, what an opportunity. And then part of you clearly looked at that and, with intense envy. <laughs> I thought, what, what's so special about her? Absolutely. What, what's she got that I haven't, you know? Yeah, yeah. But no, that was good. I found the cover. And, um, yeah, and, and Smash has played a part in it. Indeed, you did. Good work. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. Listener correspondence pours in, Mark, continues to pour in, from old friend Owen Parker, who says that he's currently reading Nightfly, which is the life of Donald Fagan from Steely Dan by Peter Jones. 
And he says, Jones claims the word scam, S-C-A-M, was not commonly used in the UK until the Royal Scam was released in 1976. And he wants to know if we have any knowledge of this. Well, we went running to the Oxford we, English we just, we just did the normal thing, which we just Googled it. <laughs> no, I, I went a bit further. I went to the OED. And, um, and according to the Oxford English Dictionary, um, and you could find scam in the Wall Street Journal in 1966. And I was in books in 1968 and was in the New York Times in, in 19, 1974. And uh, organized crime is stealing millions of dollars from the public through planned fraudulent bankruptcies called scams by the underworld. So I think I was aware of the word. I think it may have come into into greater greater you know, currency by virtue of its association with Steely Dan, but I think it was kind of known, wasn't it? Mark? Yeah, they didn't invent the word, but that's uh, that's I'm sure that's the first time I ever heard about heard of it. And uh, he's saying that that's when it kind of uh, got wings and took off, which is yeah. probably true actually. But it's grotty, also I thought was a really interesting one. He was because asking you about Grotty. Wasn't it? Grotty in a Hard Day's Night. There's a bit where George Harrison says. Uh, they're really grotty, whatever. And I do remember that at the time, thinking, that's extraordinary. And I still don't know whether he invented that or whether the scriptwriters invented that or he, that was a little puzzle. The, story, the story is that Alan Owen, who, who wrote the script of A Hard Day's Night uh, and, and spent time with the Beatles and therefore tried as far as possible to kind of ape their, um, yeah. their, their speech patterns, he he was the one who put the word grotty in. It wasn't particularly known to the Beatles at all, but he always claimed it was a, it was a Liverpool expression. Well, it, it might have been. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it probably wasn't widespread, um, but uh, it became subsequently became used during the sixties. It's very it's very English, isn't it? Grotty. Because it kind of up famously in Faulty Towers. You grotty little man. Oh, that, okay, really? Yeah, I think that, he does. Yeah, oh, really? I think it's so. Su- it sort of suggests low rent as well, doesn't yeah. it? It suggests cheap. My sisters used it all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, grotty was the word he used about going to somebody's bed sit. What's he like? Grotty. Oh, yes. <laughs> Me really yes. Kind of, Horrible grubby. and small and grubby. grubby. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's yeah, true. Right. unkempt. The other one he's also asking about, because Owen's a musician and spends a lot of time in studios, that is the derivation of, uh, of the use of the word flange to describe the, the um, automatic double-tracking technology that was pioneered by Ken Townsend. At, uh, at Abbey Road for the Beatles to save the Beatles uh, having to bother, save John Lennon particularly, having to bother double-tracking his voice. Ken invented this uh, this way of routing the signal so, he, so that he didn't have to. And, um, you know, that is still known to um, producers all over the world <laughs> all these years later as flanging. And the reason for that is that George Martin used to used to explain it to John Lennon by using terms which he got from the goons because John Lennon would would just close his ears put his fingers in his ears when anybody tried to tell him anything technical at all just would not be interested and so much preferred it if it could be referred to humorously and so flanging was was the way George Martin used to describe it so we'll just flange it there because flange does mean, in English, a widening or branching out. It's the part that it's an engineering term for, for, for something that widens But did, was it used in the goons, then? Did the goons use it's that word? Used, sure. it, it's, 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 Spike Milligan used to talk about things being flanged. And, and interestingly, the fir- uh, uh, when, when Peter Sellers was making... Um, songs for swinging in cellars. The idea okay, was that it's a brilliant record, and that is, of course, produced by George Martin. The idea was it was going to start with Peter Sellers doing a pastiche of Frank Sinatra, and they wrote a song called "You Got Me Swinging," and to teach Peter Sellers how to sing it, 
George Martin got the man who was, at the time, not known as Matt Munro, but he was just a singer, but a really good singer, was to get him in to record it. So they, they recorded Matt Munro singing You Got Me Swinging with an orchestra and, and so forth in true uh, Frank Sinatra style. So Sellers could simply impersonate that, yeah. So, so the idea being that Sellers could completely impersonate it. And when Sellers heard it, he said, well, I can't do it better than that. Just simply can't be done better than that. Just put that on the record. So they had to put that on the record. What you hear on the record is Matt Munro singing it, and he's described as Fred Flange. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, ha- what mixed feelings must Matt Munro have had about this? You know, Matt Munro had been trying for his break as a as a serious kind of swing big band singer. Finally gets a break on a comedy record. Which is... They're what? specifically to send up the idea of crooning, to make it as sound as preposterous as possible. And he's called Fred Flange. That's brilliant. You know, it's uh, that's he must have he must have felt pretty bad about that, you know. But that's that's the I'm way. I'm sure it they is. rewarded him handsomely. <laughs> well, I and he got know. to meet Peter Sellers, which would have been a big deal. I know he didn't. He didn't. He just went turned up the studio, did his bit, and you know, Peter Sellers turned up days later. He All right. Have, wouldn't have seen him at all. Um, but, you know, that fame comes in in all kinds of ways. So, and that explains why still to this day, studios and engineers all over the world are still using the word flange. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Here we go. Any other business? We're joined by Alex Gold. Are you all right, Alex? I am very all right. How are you guys? I'm fine. We've had a busy oh. time the last couple of weeks, haven't we? What have we, we recorded, have. Mark? We Remind us. Remind us. We've, yeah, we just did Tim Finn yesterday. Tim Finn, he of uh, Split Ends and Crowded House, who's made a record with Andy White. He was really good, wasn't he? He's a wonderful old wooden house in New Zealand. Very and, nice. Uh, lots of interesting things to say. Um, we talked to Toby Ames, who made a fantastic documentary about King Crimson. Absolutely. Absolutely. Out, Highly it? recommended. That is, it, you don't have to be a King Crimson fan to um, to enjoy that because it's a, it's a unique uh, profile of a band. To being in any group with the most inscrutable and uh, uh, an extraordinary leader, um, Robert Fripp. And we talked to Dylan Jones about the book that uh, he's uh, put together with Paul Weller of Paul Weller's Lyrics, which is also very, very good. Dylan Jones, well known for being feckless and work shy, you know, that uh, he's got a book about (laughs) about Paul Weller coming out. And then I discovered he's already got a book about Velvet Underground coming out, not far behind it. My God, how does he do it? Uh, So there's loads of stuff going on uh, at our end coming your way. And uh, on the, if you can remind people, Alex, it's, it's an appropriate time to remind people of the, the virtues of being a Patreon supporter. I believe it is an appropriate time, Dave. And yes, being a Patreon supporter <laughs> is uh, is the best way uh, po- possible of, of supporting uh, our noble endeavours of national importance. Um, and very broadly speaking, I won't go into detail this week, but it allows you to gain early and ad-free access to all of our content, integrate with the growing Patreon community of like-minded souls, um, and also... Uh, be the recipient of arguably the greatest birthday present a man can have. Uh, and you can do that by going to www.patreon.com forward slash word in your ear and clicking subscribe. And then you could join the likes of Al Hurton, who's this week's birthday boy, who we were talking to about something he wanted to get off his chest. The Word Podcast. Two cocoa tins and a piece of string. Okay, over to our birthday boy, Al Hinton. Al, Al, you've got a question to put put to the panel. I do. A lob to throw on the fire. Go on. <laughs> I do. You know, well, being of a certain age, uh, you know, being a sort of a tween, early teen at the turn of the 70s and uh, 80s, we had no streaming for music. We didn't have the instant access that the youth of today have. So you would hear of bands or you would hear of songs and the legacy of them before you actually had a chance to hear them. 
Um, and I'm thinking of things like ACDC to actually hear that band for the first time, or in my case, songs like Bat Out of Hell, Don't Fear the Reaper, Smoke in the Water. The only way we could really hear them, if friends didn't have them in the house, was on Tommy Vance's rock show on a Friday night. Um, and the mythology had already been built up, bigged up through sounds, which is why I used to buy being a bit of a rock kid, sounds and uh, Kerrang! and everything else. So I was wondering for you chaps, I mean, if I give you some of my experiences, if you had similar experiences of hearing of something before you heard it, and then did it live up to your expectations? Did I think it's really it's interesting a thing. That's a good question. Because it was, I, I think the thing about music, it was, it was a kind of written culture, first of all. You know, so you read about it before you heard it. Yeah. Whereas nowadays, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> Very often, it's entirely the other way around. Yeah, you'd read you know, the music papers and have to imagine what these songs sounded like. Yeah. And I can remember the enormous excitement I've been, my great age, uh, in the 60s, I can remember nothing more exciting than reading the song titles, the list of song titles for an upcoming album by the Rolling Stones, <laughs> say. And I've actually got one in front of me here. This is my copy of the Rolling Stones' Aftermath, which came out, what did it come out? 65, 66, 66. Yeah. And I can remember first reading in Record Mirror, probably, that the new Rolling Stones album would would have a song called Mother's Little Helper. <laughs> well, what was that about? Well, quite. And yeah. Stupid Girl and Lady Jane and Under My Thumb. And I don't know if it ever if it's the case anymore, but you used to read about songs and you thought, that song has to do something that no song has ever done before, just by virtue of the title. Because it was, it, it was coming at you in a, in a completely different way. It's like... <clears throat> I was thinking, I can remember reading the list of songs for Sergeant Pepper. And the most intriguing one was Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite. Yes. Ooh. You thought, how strange is that? That's not like I Love You or Meet Me Under the Bus Station Clock or, you know, Stop the War in Vietnam or whatever. It was like, what is, how is that a song? You know, but you knew the answer to that had to be fantastic. So, yeah, I think it was hugely important. Hugely important part of building up the mystique of uh, of records was reading about the ver in the first place. What about you, Mark? Well, there were some records that had a real reputation. The Wiley Shade of Pale was one. I can remember hearing, we've got to hear mm. this record. And one called The Days of Pearly Spencer by David McWilliams was just a particularly weird-sounding record. It sounded like he delivered the vocals down the telephone. But the key thing for me, and I think I might have been about 11 at the time, <clears throat> is my elder sisters told me about a record called The Eve of Destruction, by Barry Maguire, and that Great really title. caused a sensation. I don't know if you remember that, Dave. Yeah, it was yeah. an unbelievable record about the imminent nuclear war and how the entire world will be destroyed. Yes, and that, and that, you know, I don't think I'd release it now, actually. I think it'd be too terrible. No, it'd be too frightening. <laughs> you'd have to have a trigger warning. Yeah, <laughs> the idea that, yeah, the, the, the rivers with bodies floating, you know, oh, my God. And I had this image of these kind of... Um, you know, warmongering presidents and with their with their with their fingers on on the bony fingers on the button, ready to launch the atomic bomb. And I can remember being absolutely terrified. And we had to take it in turns all day to sit by the radio in case it came on, and we would shout if it did. Everyone would run and listen to it. That was amazing. But yeah, big excitement. Yeah, yeah. So yes, I think you're absolutely right, Al. Um, that it's uh, it's part of culture that has. Uh, was very valuable, yeah. uh, but, it, but it's kind of gone, it really. Has. You know, I, know. I suppose you may you may get a little bit of it when an artist is releasing some new material, but you'll never get the, the one I always remember is um, "Don't Fear the Reaper." I mean, right. what, a, yeah. what a song title! So in my head, in my teenage head, I've got these Black Sabbath trito and Devil's Interval chords all going, and you know, yeah. evil atmospheric strings in the background, and I get this twangy guitar and a cowbell. I was like, I just felt so let down by it. I think it's a How great you? song. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's a great that. song, don't get me wrong, but I was like, oh, okay. And then it goes into this proggy mid late, and I thought, oh, I like that bit. Yeah, yeah. And then it goes oh. back to the, the jangly guitars and everything else. So, and <laughs> and Bat Out of Hell, uh, again, wonderful song, but the whole album didn't seem to make sense to me. You know, it's, it's a rock album, but it's not somehow. Yeah, yeah. You know, I liked the album. I liked the picture on the back of Ellen Foley. I remember that. You know, I had a little 13-year-old self like that. <laughs> but um, 
And it was only years later when I read an interview that said that uh, Jim Steinman had conceived it as a kind of a musical theatre piece. Yeah. The whole thing. The, the whole thing just then coalesced. I mean, that's why that's why it works. Well, they were theatre people, weren't they? Uh, yeah. Jim, Jim Simon and uh, and Meat. Meat they were, the, from musicals, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. they were. That's 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 the angle they came from. But it did did well for them, certainly. So, well, look, nice to talk to you, Al. Yeah, uh, oh, thanks for having me on for the birthday. Yeah. That's all Not right. Is it? Thanks, for, thanks for your support, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next year. Who knows? This podcast was brought to you by The Word. And-